Welcome to section 20.1. This is the final chapter that we're going to cover in Chem 1C. Okay, gentle people, what we're going to do in this chapter is we're going to talk about nuclear chemistry. Now, this is kind of a bridge between physics and chemistry, and we're going to do a deep dive into atomic structure and what the nucleus can do. Now, these are fundamentally different reactions. Traditionally, what we've done in chemistry is we have talked about reactions between elements coming together, and this involves a rearrangement of electrons. Now what we're going to do is we are going to look at what is going to happen at the nucleus itself and reactions of the nucleus. So the first thing we got to do is we got to talk about the parts inside the nucleus. And so the nucleus is made out of nucleons. Now, the nucleons you guys are familiar with are protons, which have a positive charge, and neutrons, which have a neutral charge. Now, the nucleus is glued together by the fundamental force called the strong force. Now, this, now this force, as its name implies, is a very, very strong interaction. However, it is a very short-range force. It only works to 10 to the negative 15th meters. And so it's only when things are very close that this dominates. Now, it is so strong that it overcomes the electrostatic repulsion where I have two protons, which are both positively charged, and these things are still sticking together. And that's because of the strong force. Now, again, I want to remind you guys of stuff from Chem 1A. So let's start off with a quick little quiz question about stuff you learned in Chem 1A. All right, gentle people, go ahead and read this quiz question and give me the correct answer. All right, gentle people, in Chem 1A, we talked about how we can represent elements through their chemical symbols. In this chapter, it's real important to use the elemental symbol in its full glory. So let's go ahead and review how we'd write this out. When you write down the elemental symbol, what you guys are going to do is on the bottom left hand corner, you guys are going to put the atomic number. Now the atomic number is the number of protons that we have in this element. So on that quiz question, we said that this was 26 and the 26 is the atomic number. Now, because this is the number of protons, this identifies the element that we're interested in. And so we can look on the periodic table and we can go ahead and see that element number 26 is iron. And so we can cut its two letter abbreviation, so FE. And the next thing that we can do is we can look at this top number. So the number on the top left is going to be called the mass number. And the mass number is the number of protons plus neutrons. So in this case, we had 56. So what we can do is we can take 56 minus 26, or rather the mass number minus the atomic number. What we will get out is the number of neutrons. So in this case, 30 neutrons. And so now what we can do is we can see that the correct answer here is choice number D. So let's go ahead and talk about that nucleus in a little bit more depth. So let's take a look at one of the graphs that your book provides you. On the x-axis of this graph, what you guys will find is the number of protons. And on the y-axis of this graph, what you will see is the number of neutrons. What they graphed here is what we find in nature. And so what you'll see as the red dots are the most stable versions of each type of atom or nucleus that we can find. And what you guys will also see in the blue dots are things where we can make it, but they are not as stable as the ones in the red dots. Now, what you guys will see is that at the start of the periodic table or the lighter elements, that the ratio between the number of protons and the number of neutrons is in a one-to-one -one ratio. But as you get to heavier and heavier nucleuses, what you'll see is you will need to have more neutrons to make a stable nucleus. When we start getting to around mercury, we need about one and a half neutrons per proton. Now, this goes into the idea about thinking about the nucleus. And I want you to really think about this. 
you have a proton that's a positive charge, and then you're going to stick it right next to another proton, which is another positive charge. And all throughout chemistry, we've been saying electrons, these things that have negative charges, they want to stay away from each other and they spread out. But here in the nucleus, we have positive charges and we're sticking them together. And the reason we can stick them together is because of that strong force. But we need something else to kind of provide that glue. We can't just keep ramming protons together without trying to provide some counter effect. And that's what neutrons are doing. They're increasing the amount of strong interactions we have in the nucleus without adding charge. So as you get heavier and heavier, you're going to get more and more positive charges crowding out. So to counter that effect, you guys are going to need to put more neutrons on there. What you guys will see here is that there's this band of stability where we find stable nuclei. Now around it is the sea of instability. And here we have not found atoms with that composition. There are theories out there that there might be some islands out here or some places uh, where we can have stability in some weird ratios. And that's what a lot of researchers are looking for. So what happens when you make one of these unstable nuclei? Well, anything that's unstable is going to want to break down and go to its lowest energy form. So an unstable nuclei is going to decay and try to get to a stable nuclei. Now, we are going to change our composition inside our nucleus. So this is what this chapter is about, changing the nucleus. So we're going to go through a series of reactions. And what I want you to know is some things are going to be tweaked from the traditional chemical reactions that you've seen before. So the first reaction that I want to talk about is something called alpha decay. And the idea here is we have an unstable nucleus. So in this case, uranium-238, and it is going to decay. Now, what it's going to do is release what's called an alpha particle. Now, this is the symbol for the alpha particle. Now, what you guys will see that it is made out of two protons and four minus two, two neutrons. So this is a helium nucleus, and that's why they put HE. Now, I want you guys to remember that an alpha particle is different from a helium atom. A helium atom has electrons on it. The alpha particle is just the nucleus. It is just the two protons and two neutrons. So let's take a look at this reaction. Uranium-238 is going to go ahead and break up into an alpha particle. Now what I need to do is I need to balance my reaction. Now traditionally speaking, when we balance chemical reactions, we made sure that the same number of atoms appeared on both sides. But because my nucleus is changing, the definition of my atom or the atom itself is changing and I cannot balance it through the elemental symbols. Instead, what I'm going to be looking at is the mass number and the atomic number. These are the things that I want to balance. So if we take a look at the left hand side of my chemical equation, I have 92 as my atomic number. So what I want to do is on the other side of the reaction, I want to make sure that I maintain that 92. So in this case, 2 plus 90 gets me 92. And so what I'm going to decay into is Th a thorium nucleus. Now, we also have to balance our mass number. So on top here, I had 238. So what I want to make sure is the right hand side, all the mass numbers add up to 238. So I know I'm making my alpha particle, so it is four. So that must mean that 234 is the, is the isotope of thorium that I am going to make. So another way an unstable nucleus can decay is called beta decay. We are going to talk about a beta particle and we're going to talk about negative beta particles. They don't put the negative in your textbook. Uh, so we're just going to just call them beta particles and not use that qualifier. Now, a beta particle is essentially an electron. 
So it is a high energy electron that is being ejected out of my nucleus. So if we were to compare the mass of an electron to a neutron and a proton, it is insignificant. So if I look at the mass number of my beta particle, it is zero. Now to do some bookkeeping, what I'm gonna say is that the beta particle has an atomic mass of negative one. And that has to do with the charge of an electron. The number of protons is our formerly our atomic number. And since an electron is the opposite in charge of a proton, it gets a negative one. So if I have carbon 14, it goes under decay, it makes a beta particle. And so again, I'm gonna balance my reactions. Atomic numbers on this side, six, seven minus one will get us six. And so what I'm gonna make is I'm gonna make a nitrogen atom. And then if I look at the top, since my beta particle has zero as, as its mass number, 14 just carries over. So if I go ahead and go under a beta particle decay, you can kind of think of this as me taking a neutron and changing it into a proton and ejecting a high energy electron out. And so what you will see is the atomic number increases, but the mass number stays the same. Next, we can talk about positron emission. Now, a positron is the first antiparticle that I am going to talk to you guys about. An antiparticle is a particle that has the opposite charge to one of the traditional particles that we've talked about. And so in this case, a positron is an anti-electron. A positron has all the same characteristics of an electron with one exception. It has the opposite charge. So instead of being negative like an electron, a positron has a positive charge. So let's go ahead and get a symbol for my positron. Because it has the same mass as an electron, it is negligible in our calculations, so it is zero, just like our beta particle or our electron. Now, since it has a positive charge, it is going to go ahead and have a one when I start doing its atomic number. So let's go ahead and look at our unstable nucleus. So we've got fluorine 18. It goes under positron emission. And so again, I'm gonna do my whole balancing act. In this case, on my atomic numbers, it is going to be nine on the left-hand side. Eight plus one gets me nine. Again, because the positron has negligible mass, my mass number stays the same at 18. So what you guys can think of is that when something goes under a positron emission, you are converting a proton into a neutron. Again, my mass number is unchanged, but now my atomic number is decreased. So one of the things that science nerds love to talk about is matter-antimatter reactions. So if I have a beta particle or formerly a high energy electron and I combine my electron with an anti-electron, well, what I'm gonna have is what's called an annihilation reaction. When matter and antimatter collide, they are going to cancel each other out. Now, when they go ahead and collide and cancel each other out, I'm going to release pure energy. And so this is why science fiction loves this stuff. It is formally taking matter and taking matter into pure energy. And so what you have here is you have your atomic number and your mass number both becoming zero, uh, but to denote that energy is being released, we're gonna say gamma radiation, which is high energy light or high energy electromagnetic radiation gets released out of this thing. Now, speaking of high energy electromagnetic radiation, there's one other way that we can get gamma rays to be formed. Uh, one way to get gamma rays to be formed is if you actually excite the nucleus. Now, an excited nucleus is denoted by putting a star next to its atomic symbol. And what you're saying is that the nucleus itself is excited. Now, I'm not too knowledgeable uh, on this, but the basic idea is you can think of electrons 
and electrons. They have orbitals. You can give electrons energy and you can go to the excited state and then the electrons will return to the ground state. Now, the nucleons, the protons, and the nucleus, we can put them in a higher energy state, and then when they fall back down, they will release energy. Just turns out to excite a nucleus, you need a ton of energy to do it. And so when you actually form an excited nucleus, then you can get gamma emission out of it. All right, gentlemen, people, the last kind of reaction that I want you guys to know is called electron capture. Uh, and remember, a high energy electron is a beta particle. We can take that electron and slam it into our nucleus. Now, I want you guys to be careful. This isn't reduction. When we what we talked to you guys before is that when we take an electron and we add it to an atom, we're adding it to the orbitals, and that is called a reduction. For an electron capture, I'm taking the electron and slamming it into the nucleus. So the nucleus is absorbing this electron. So let's go ahead and try to balance everything out. My atomic numbers, 13 minus 1 gets me the new nucleus of 12, which corresponds to magnesium. Again, my beta particle has negligible mass, so my mass number retains itself. And so what you guys can do is you can see that my atomic number decreases, but my mass number stays unchanged. Okay, gentle people, with that said, let's go ahead and practice some nuclear chemistry. Let's say that I have potassium-40. Let's go ahead and do an electron capture with potassium-40. What do I get if I have a successful capture? Okay, gentle people, let's go ahead and tackle this one out. So I'm going to write 40 upon 19. I'm going to put my potassium, and then I'm going to do my electron capture. So that's going to be 0 upon negative 1. And then I'm going to put my symbol for my beta particle. I'm going to do this reaction, and let's go ahead and balance this out. So 19 minus 1 gets me 18. And so now I can go ahead and define my atom. I'm going to go to my periodic table. And if I look up element number 18, that's going to be argon. And then last thing I can do is I can do 40 plus 0, and that just gets me 40. So I balanced out my mass number. So what I should make out of this is I should make argon 40. All right, gentle people, I hope that made sense. And remember Chem 1C to stay safe.